Well, greetings, everyone. This is David Arendale, and I get a chance to talk to you about Structured Learning Assistance, which is one of the major peer learning programs that are used at institutions across the United States. There are six programs which I follow in particular. The one that we'll be focusing on for this short video, it'll be SLA. A definition of SLA would be it's a mandatory workshop supporting academic success of students enrolled in a historically challenging course. It was developed at Ferris State University and has been adopted at institutions across the United States. The goal is the improvement of academic achievement of all students in historically challenging courses, courses where there's high rates of D's, F's, W's, and incompletes. The major assumption of SLA is that we've got to avoid stigma, and one of the ways that we do that is to make sure that all students are going to be involved in the program. It's embedded into the course. It really avoids this problem of students who most need to be there. Well, they choose not to because they fear the stigma. And from the research, we know that all students benefit from participation in these mandatory workshops. Well, what are the requirements? Well, from an instructor point of view, there's a number of things. They don't have to really change the way that they teach their course. However, they need to spend time, so that would probably be one of the big ingredients in the program. They need to know what's going on during those workshops. The SLA participants, well, they're going to be there on an average of two hours every week. The SLA leaders, which are former students who've done well inside of this course, well, they're going to end up developing lesson plans in order to provide structure to those workshop sessions. And those need to be discussed with the faculty member to receive feedback from them. Also, attendance reports are provided to the faculty members because attendance and participation in SLA workshops is mandatory. And also, uh, the um, SLA um, facilitator can provide feedback back to the instructor about how things are going in the course, which areas seem to be the most challenging for them. And then it's up to the faculty member to make a decision whether or not they'll make future uh, course corrections on the basis of that. It's really for the faculty member to talk about how this is a seamless part of their course and to talk about how important it is. It's going to be inside of the syllabus. There's also a supervisor needs to be involved with managing the program. The faculty members already got enough things to do. We can't expect them to somehow try to be able to run this program as well. So a separate person is going to be the supervisor, and they're in charge of the recruitment, hiring, and training. They're the ones that do the evaluation of the program, and they provide the overall program administration. SLA may be a separate job duty for this person solely because the SLA program is so large, or it may end up being part of their other job duties. What are some other requirements if you're going to go and do this? I mean, what else does the institution have to do from an investment point of view? Well, you've got to have some stable funding, and we need to know on a predictable basis that we're going to have the salaries not only for that supervisor, but also for those students then. We need to have a different classroom for these SLA sessions to occur inside of. And also these workshops are going to be pre-scheduled. So it's going to be clear to the students on the very first day of class, well, what are the expectations for the class sessions, the class lectures, any labs that are associated with it, and the SLA sessions itself. Now, this issue about participation, there are some programs where students only have to go to the SLA workshops until the first major exam. And then at that time, if they had an A or a B, well, optional attendance is for them following. If they had a C or below, it's mandatory attendance for the rest of the term. However, there are some SLA programs, it is mandatory throughout the entire academic term. 
So you can actually read up about that uh, as that's described in articles. In terms of the workshop operation, if I ended up coming in, what is it that I would end up seeing occurring? Well, number one, we're going to be reinforcing the core concepts that are being talked about inside of the class. We're going to be working on developing um, the prerequisite knowledge that they need in order to be successful in this class and classes further in the academic sequence. We're also going to have test reviews, and also we're going to have time to uh, teach study skills and to be able to practice them in order to make sure we really understand them. As I said, it's a mix. Some programs have mandatory, some not. But for the most part, it's important to understand it's mandatory up through at least the first examination. So they end up having two one-hour workshops each week. And as I said earlier, they're going to track the attendance, and that's going to be provided back to the instructor. And it'll be up to the instructor to decide what kind of impact that will end up having on the final course grades for the students. There's some other additional responsibilities for the SLA facilitators, both inside of class. They kind of take on a role in many of the classes as a teaching assistant or an undergraduate teaching assistant, as it may be. Handing out materials, being a resource for them, also assisting students if there's permission for the professor to do so. And also, they're taking notes and participating in the class activities along with everybody else. Students end up watching whoever it is that's inside of class, whether they have the role of a tutor or whether they have the role of a workshop leader. They're going to be attentive to them whenever they are taking notes, being attentive, participating in the class activities. Also, there's a role for the SLA facilitators outside of the classroom, and that is to do follow-up on students who are absent. Faculty members uh, oftentimes have hundreds and hundreds of students for which they're responsible. The SLA facilitator can help play the in-between role for contacting students to see how they're doing, seeing whether there's anything that, uh, campus resources they need be directed to, and also just simply to communicate to them that someone noticed that they weren't there and they're just concerned and they'd like to know and encourage them to come back to the class again. So once again, it's another way to know who are the struggling students who are on campus. So that's the reason why SLA, like many of the other um, uh, peer learning programs, are among the first line of finding out whether there are students in need. Oftentimes, faculty members will not know. I just retired from a 40-year career as a uh, teacher, and it's hard for me to know what's going on amongst all of my students. I do the best I can, but if they're not there, then somebody needs to follow up. And oftentimes, faculty members would do so. I would do so, but not on a regular basis. SLA leaders, they're able to do this on a consistent basis. Well, how do SLA programs been evaluated. If you look at the professional literature and look at the research studies, how have SLA programs done? Well, it's been adopted nationwide, and there's been high reports of success of higher grades for the students. You don't need to change anything at the institutional level because this is something that's based off of the course level. Now, the place where However, you're going to need that high-level institutional support is going to be in terms of the stable financial support so we know that it's there. It takes an awful lot of interest and faculty time, and oftentimes, no pun intended, time is the most expensive resource that's required for any of these peer-assisted learning programs. Generally, an undergraduate would have the skill set needed in order to be able to serve as an SLA facilitator. Obviously, we need to have a salary for the student and also for the professional staff member. So if you kind of add it all up, what's the bottom line? It's highly effective for increasing success of students in historically difficult courses. There's obviously an investment cost in order to be able to have a program, but the question comes down to what is more expensive, the cost investment in setting up the program 
or the costliness of student dropouts. I just simply found several articles that have been published about uh, SLA in recent years. There's been a number of articles that have been written about the use of SLA in nursing programs. So that uh, health care programs are of interest. Look for that whenever you look at the bibliography for SLA articles. There's also a website that you can go to with extensive information about SLA. And for those of you who are listening on the podcast, I'll simply speak it out the uh, URL address. It's www.ferris.edu slash SLA slash. And uh, for those of you who are seeing this, this is just simply a little bit of what the menu uh, is for all of the information which is available about SLA. And I highly recommend that you go and check out the site to see the training materials, the research studies, and the other info that you'd find really helpful to give a thoughtful review and thought about adoption of SLA. I also maintain a bibliography of all of the articles that I've been able to find about those six major peer learning programs I mentioned at the beginning of this video. At this point, there's nearly 1,550 publications. And what I have inside the bibliography is that I have the abstract, and for many of the publications, they have web links. So you can actually go and download or read online the research publications and learn more about any of these programs. And in particular, we're talking about structured learning assistance. Then. And where do you go to find that? z.umn.edu slash peerbib. And not only will you find the general bibliography of the 1500, it's also broken out by these different program types. So you can be able to just look at the articles about SLA along with the web links to be able to look at them online. And also there are topics. At the time of recording of this video in March of 2020, uh, many colleges across the United States and around the world are closing and moving to online instruction and online academic support. And one of the topical sub-bibliographies that I have is on online versions of these different programs. So I think you might end up finding that useful if you took a look at that. We already talked about one of the four web pages that are on this particular page. We've already talked about the one for Peer Bib. That's what was on the previous slide. I also have one that's looking at peer learning. That is a collection of resources that were developed by other people that I maintain and want to promote. And those include training materials on how we did peer learning at my institution at the University of Minnesota. So that's z.umn.edu slash peer learning. There's also one that has the same beginning of that, z.umn.edu slash peer bib, excuse me, um, pubs peer. Well, those are all the articles that I've written about supplemental instruction and about the hybrid program, which we developed at the University of Minnesota called Peer Assisted Learning then. And then the final uh, web link is to the YouTube channel, which I maintain, Peer Learning YouTube. And that also has a collection of overview videos for the other major peer-assisted learning programs. And then at the bottom of the screen, there is the contact information. They'll call me on the phone, send me emails, and also for my personal um, web page, under which these four pages here at the top are all located. So I find this an exciting area. I've been doing research and helping to manage these programs for decades. I think that they've been an enormous impact on success for students, and I think there's a lot that we have to learn from our colleagues. I just want to say thanks for listening today, and I hope my words are useful in your work in helping students to achieve their dreams. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.